Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the Sunday morning meeting of the Humanists of Greater Portland. My name is Jeff Strang and I'll be the MC today. I also play the role of secretary on the HDP Board of Directors. Our Zoom host today is Dave DiNucci, who's also our president. We've got a hybrid meeting format with attendance in person here at Friendly House. Uh, we have about 14 people here and also on Zoom. The Humanists of Greater Portland is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a non-theistic worldview with ethical values informed by scientific knowledge and driven by a desire to meet the needs of people in the here and now. At the foundation of those values is an affirmation of the dignity of every human being. Humanists of Greater Portland is an all volunteer group that believes strongly in freedom of speech. As usual, we'll start our program today with a reading or musical selection. This week by Mike Bershay. Um, and Mike is stepping up to the microphone now to do his reading. Okay, this is uh, from the blog called Murmurs from my uh, former uh, fellow carrier, Mur Brewster. This is called America Wants a Pony. The problem as I see it is that you gave America a pony when it was little and that it sets up America's expectations for the rest of its life. You can't blame America for wanting a pony. Everyone, will want, everyone wants a pony. But in a mature household, the kid isn't supposed to be in charge or get whatever they want just because they want it. There are other considerations that kids may be forgiven for not being aware of, but adults should have a broader perspective. You've got the original cost of the pony. You've got the upkeep of the pony and the massive acreage devoted to oats and hay and the maintenance of the trails. You make America promise to pick up the pony poop? Of course you did. But it doesn't take long to discover that the pony just drops a load every which way where and everyone else's pony is doing the same thing. So after a while, nobody's picking up the poop. Now, America is all grown up and hasn't learned to account for all the costs because she was massively indulged as a child and we're chest deep in pony poop. But we've gotten used to it and everyone thinks we still got a little time before we actually suffocate. It's an odd thing. Most people might agree that the government should not have to ensure that we can build a house in a flood zone 10 times over. Sure, there was an effort to, made to drain swamps and pave over wetlands and otherwise God-proof our habitat so we can build wherever we want to, but water is water. And at some point, it's going to jump the Army Corps of Engineers banks. And it really doesn't make much sense to pretend otherwise. We get that, especially if somebody else's house that keeps getting flooded. But we still think it makes sense to live where it's 115 degrees and climbing, and we still think the president owes us $3 gasoline, and we've always had that pony. Even we think $3 is what the pony's worth, what we pay at the pump is the extent of our view. We don't reckon what we also pay through our taxes for exploration, drilling, pipelines, subsidies to oil companies, profits, and massive military largely dedicated to assure our access to oil. We certainly don't account for the poop accumulation, the cost of wildfires, hurricane, flood, drought, inundation of shorelines, the disintegration of the food chain, the inev inevitable wars of conquest for shrinking territory, the ability to sustain life itself. That should be on the pump price too. And now we're stuck needing it cheap. Everything for the last hundred years was built to ensure we needed it. We don't have cheap, reliable mass transit. We're living far away from the market. The Walmart is clear on the edge of town. You put the railroad tracks down, you determine where the towns spring up. Our car infrastructure ensures we require cars. We didn't used to have air conditioning and we didn't need air conditioning, but because we didn't live where it was too hot. Those were, who were basically shut down their econo economies in the summertime. But the last 50 years have seen mass migration to the Sun Belt because of air conditioning and now we require it. We can't live without it, we can't sustain it, we're screwed. All we know is we still want the pony. Daddy promised, we're gonna ride it right off the cliff. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
The topic of our meeting today is Searching for Ourselves, The Quest for Life Beyond Earth, presented by Gordon Walker. Dr. Walker is a former professor of astrophysics at the University of British Columbia in Victoria, or no, Vancouver, but I think he's um, coming to us from Victoria today. His lab there at the University of British Columbia produced some of the first low light level digital detection systems for major ground and space-based telescopes. He's had a long-term interest in the composition and optical properties of dust and gas clouds in interstellar space, and is currently designing an infrared space telescope to look for evidence of life in extrasolar planetary atmospheres. Dr. Walker, you're welcome to HGP, and we thank you for presenting to us today. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to come and talk to you this morning. And uh, when I was about seven years old, I was walking home with my father in the dark, it happened to be wartime, so there was no lights around. And I'd seen the stars. I didn't know what they were. and I said, asked him, what are the stars? And he said to me simply, there are other suns, but they're so far away, they just look like points of light. And in those few words, he covered the, the history of astronomy and uh, human thought, but also was able to tell me about the extent of the universe. My natural reaction was it can't be that big. And I thought, maybe it is. And I got a little astronomy book, and uh, I uh, quickly learned about something called the uh, light year, which gave me some idea of the extent <clears throat> and size of the universe. You're going to have to put up with the fact that I'm talking from Canada in kilometers. It's not a difficult con uh, conversion. The velocity of light is 300,000 kilometers every second. And it only takes about just over a second for light to travel to us from the moon. But it takes the better part of eight minutes from the sun. If the sun stopped shining right now, we wouldn't know about it for eight minutes. But if you consider how far it is to the nearest star, it takes more than four years traveling at the speed of light for light to get to us from the nearest star. But in fact, as I'll indicate later the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, actually has a, an Earth-like planet going around it, possibly in a zone which would make it habitable. But these distances mean that we're never going to get to the stars ourselves. And uh, I always had to tell that to uh, students in my early courses, and they were somewhat disappointed, I think. So if you look up at the sky, just about every point of light there, this is taken in the Southern Hemisphere, is a star. But the stars are gathered into uh, this Milky Way cloud, which is the densest part. And there are two fainter galaxies off to one side. And the uh, nearest star, Alpha Centauri, is here. You can see it in the Southern sky. And what we're looking at is the edge-on view of our galaxy. We are sitting inside a galaxy with some uh, uh, 10 to the 11th. I hope these powers of 10 are something you can understand. Or Anyway, I put it in zeros up there. This is a galaxy that is very similar to ours, seen on the edge. And it's about 100,000 light years across. So it takes light about 100,000 years to travel from one side to the other. And it contains something like 10 to the power of 11 stars. The James Webb telescope has just gone up recently. Here's one of the first images it took. It took an image of a tiny little part of the sky uh, without many bright stars in it. And everything you see in there, except for the particularly bright things, are galaxies. There are galaxies everywhere. 
Not only that, you can actually see galaxies which are very distant, but are drawn out as little streaks here. That's because this very uh, large galaxy in the foreground acts as a telescope for very distant galaxies and produces false images. Don't worry about that if it's difficult to follow. I'll be talking about that very briefly again later. So when we add up as many of, uh, galaxies as we can see in the sky, we can see uh, about 10 to the power of 12 galaxies. That means there's more than about 10 to the power of 23 stars. These are very large numbers. But it's just to give you some idea of how extraordinarily large the universe is. And so one can make a, a hand-waving gesture and say, well, surely there must be some other civilizations out there, many of them perhaps. And for all I know, there's another lecture going on in another galaxy right now saying all of the same things. And it Giordano Bruno, Bruno was uh, very perceptive way back in the 16th century. He pointed out that, in fact, there must be planets around other stars, and uh, we can't see the, the planets because the suns are far so much more, uh, so much brighter. And so it's very likely that there are other people living out there. And it's, yeah, unfortunately, you probably know. He was executed for just saying that. Not only him, but uh, several other uh, friars. I'd like to dedicate this talk to the memory of people like uh, uh, Bruno. So moving forward to the uh, to 2022, that's the, very recently. We now know something like 5,000 planets around other stars roughly speaking. And there may well be as many as 10 planets in each planetary system. And each planet on average may have as many as 10 satellites. My reason for including the satellites I'll explain later as potential sites for life. So the possible sites for life goes up to this number of one followed by 25 zeros. It's a colossal number. And if you want a comparison, it's more than a million times the number of sand grains on Earth. Even I find that very hard to, to handle. Okay. So the likelihood that life has arisen elsewhere seems to me extremely high. So the initial attempt to measure or to find planets was based on the fact that the only thing we could see was the uh, star around which it would be moving. And so as the Earth or planets go around our sun, they pivot around a center of gravity just like this. But we can't see uh, the, the star, they excuse me, the planet, because it's too faint by comparison. It's millions of times fainter. So what, what we actually look for is this independent motion of the star on the sky. Now in the solar system, we have uh, these eight planets the terrestrial planets, which are uh, you know all, all, all about, but the most massive are Jupiter and Saturn, and those would be the ones which perturb the motion of the sun most. As you know, uh, the uh, the terrestrial planets sit close to the sun, whereas Jupiter and Saturn are about five and more times further away than the Earth. So those are the ones which would have the, the uh, effect on our, the, the motion of the sun as seen as a star. So if you're, if you're on a planet somewhere else and looking back at the sun, in this case, about 33 light years away, 
that it would appear to execute this curious motion on the sky. And these numbers here correspond to the date. And that's a motion of 22 milliarc seconds, which I'm sure doesn't mean a lot to many of you, but it's extremely small. Coming back to Canada, it's the equivalent of looking at a Canadian dollar 4,000 kilometers away from where you're sitting. That would be somewhere like New York. And you have to detect that motion over uh, a period of many years. Astronomers at the beginning thought, well, we can probably detect this motion uh, taking photographs of the sky and watching for uh, these small deviations of, of stars. And this they did, uh, quite a few of them, using uh, refracting telescopes and uh, photographic emulsions. But the system was altogether uh, too crude. The emulsions and so forth were far too um, poor at, in terms of making that detection. But nonetheless, they kept coming forward with all sorts of uh, candidate star uh, planets around nearby stars. Here's the list of the stars here, which are very close to the sun. And the distances are given here in light years. And they came up with uh, planet, Jupiter mass planets going around them with periods of tens or, or more years, or in this case, 4.8. In fact, these all turned out to be wrong and brought the whole issue of looking for planets into disrepute. The one here, Epsilon Eridani, I've said it, we did in fact detect a, a planet around it using the technique which uh, we developed, but it was totally different from the one which had been suggested by the astrometrists. We found something which was closer to a Jupiter mass and in seven year orbit. And in fact, no planets have ever been discovered by using this astrometric technique, although they persisted for years and the subject was drew a lot of skepticism, unfortunately. So our technique was to look at the star's motion in the line of sight. That is not only is it a star seen edge on in its orbit with the planet going around it, would appear to uh, execute a backwards and forwards motion in the line of sight. And that was, the, that was the signature we wanted to look for. And that's based, we're going to base it on the Doppler effect, which I'm pleased to believe we've got to work. I hope this is an explanation for you. The Doppler effect is, is the change in wavelength associated with motion uh, towards or away from us. In this case, it's sound. That is, you hear the change of the tone as the vehicle is going, coming towards us and it's going away from us. But of course, the velocity of sound is about a million times smaller than the velocity of light. So it's, a, it's much more challenging uh, to, to use light. But this is what we were going to look for. This, is, this is, would have been if the sun had been our target, then we would have expected to see uh, the, the, the velocity of the sun change only by meters per second, which is you know about the speed you go on a bicycle, over a very long time scale. And this we would expect to see only about one part in 30 million. And uh, this would be take place over a, uh, a long period uh, of, of tens of years. And uh, the challenge was that one couldn't do it at the time using photographic plates. One had to await a uh, much better class of detector. But this is where we made a mistake. And everybody did. 
we were looking for ourselves. That is, we were looking for the solar system. We'd been led to believe that you wouldn't expect to have Jupiters at, uh, close to the sun, when in fact, that's what turned out uh, to happen in the initial discoveries. And uh, Otto Struve in 1952 had said, why don't you look for planets close to, to uh, suns? And there you'll almost certainly find something and you could even look for eclipses. But we, and, uh, but it had to wait about 40 years before anybody actually got around and discovering that. We could have discovered these things much earlier. Now, uh, you're quite safe in this at, at the moment because I've put next to you a neutron star. A neutron star contains uh, more mass than the sun, but it's concentrated into an object about 10, 20 kilometers across. And it's so dense that it's crushed the matter into the density of uh, an atomic nucleus. And it not only has a, 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 uh, that high density, it has an extremely powerful magnetic field, trillions of times more than the uh, magnetic field of the Earth. And in addition, the neutron star is spinning much faster than you see it here. And a jet of uh, relativistic electrons is coming out. Now, you don't have to understand any of that, but they, the, the, the result is that if you're in the line of sight of those jets, you'll see a bright flash every time it goes across, like, just like a lighthouse. And this is what happened. This, this was actually detected by Voxon and uh, Frail. Uh, and they you simply, you, by simply counting pulses in a given time interval, they were able to use the Doppler effect to detect uh, planets very similar or super Earths in very similar uh, mass to that of the Earth in quite short period orbits. And uh, th this was in uh, 1992. But again, I realized that people were not so interested because the, uh, this work was done with the um, Arecibo uh, radio dish. People were not so interested because, and then I, let me go back again, I'm losing my track of myself here. Uh, people were not interested because I, I attended a meeting devoted to looking for extrasolar planets in Hawaii at that time. And Volksan was at that meeting. The people who were using radio velocities like ourselves didn't get much time and he got none. So I gave him half of my time. I couldn't imagine why people were not interested. Here were the first discoveries of Earth-like planets. But of course, the reason was, oopsie, and I think they should have got the Nobel Prize, but it's because the, those planets were not suitable for life, and therefore people were not uh, sufficiently interested, or did, at that time they were not. So let's, you seem to want to know something about what we did. So I'm going to go through it. Uh, fairly quickly, and if you don't follow it all, at least you'll be able to understand the conclusions. So when you spread the light of a star out in its colors, it's crossed by a number of dark lines which correspond to elements and uh, other things in its atmosphere. And these, can, these will shift as the uh, star moves towards and away from us. And it's measuring that very small shift that I talked about before that was the challenge for us. We started off by using cell state detectors. This is back in 1975, which had been de developed for um, uh, high speed print reading. And uh, a colleague of mine, Bruce Campbell, and I developed a system whereby you passed the starlight through a uh, gas cell filled with hydrogen fluoride gas, 
in order to impose uh, lines in the spectrum of the star, which would act as a fiducial. We're also, my, at that time, my graduate student, Stevenson Yang, was uh, part of the trio that made this work. It was uh, also involved some very dangerous preparation of uh, hydrogen fluoride, which uh, in retrospect, we should have been a lot more careful about. So here is a, a representation. At the upper part, you're looking at what we call a spectrum. That is the light intensity from the star. Uh, and where there are dips, there's light being absorbed. These are absorption lines. And these little stars indicate that it's, uh, th these absorptions are in the star. And we imposed by passing the, the gas through a cell, these, what I outlined in red, the lines of hydrogen fluoride. And these allowed us to make very carefully measure the displacement of these lines uh, from time to time and every time we observed. And we have obtained this uh, uh, precision, which was necessary of about 10 meters per second. And we were, the, this, this program was adopted at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope, which was, uh, which was completed in 79. Bruce Campbell became the resident astronomer there and got the whole set of equipment going. And uh, we got observing time a few nights per year uh, for 12 years, looking at a number of solar type stars, but it was all on the premise that we would discover things like Jupiter at the di distance of Jupiter. And, uh, you know, with 11, 12 year orbits. Then in 1998, uh, 1988, uh, Bruce gave me a call. He was back in Victoria by that time, and I was at, the, at UBC, which is sort of line of sight, but it's across the body of water. He said, hey, I think we found a planet. What he'd found is what you see in the upper diagram here. That is the change in velocity of this particular star, Gamma Cephei. And you see it's changing quite dramatically on this scale. But that's got nothing to do with a planet. It just means there's an unseen star in the system. It's a double star, but the other star is too faint to be seen. But what he noticed was this slight ripple on the top. And when he took out the effect of the, the uh, unseen star, there was beginning to be the signature of which, uh, which we would consider to be due to a, 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 an attendant planet. Now, just going fast forward, this was picked up on by um, another group who were, had uh, started looking for uh, planets using a similar technique, but using iodine rather than hydrogen fluoride. And they have observed this now over the years, uh, tens of years. First of all, they detect the orbit of the unseen star, and then these ripples are persistent over the top. And there you see the signature of the planet, the sort of thing that I was showing you that we would look for, uh, this continual zigzag or sine wave, which actually corresponds to a planet of uh, a, about two um, Jupiter masses, in a two and a half year orbit. So there's an artist's uh, impression that was produced at the time. We've no idea that that's what it really looks like. This is a so-called planet in the foreground. The bright star, which we could see and measured is the one on the right. And then the faint one, uh, which was un invisible at the time and which has been subsequently detected is on the left. I want to bring in that at this time, there's a lot of skepticism even of our work. And uh, there had been possibly uh, rather optimistic statements made about what could and could not be detected. There are also a lot of people who didn't think this was astronomy. There were those who 
for what I suspect for religious reasons, uh, didn't want this to be pushed at all. We actually had uh, some astronomers get up and walk out of the room if we stood up to talk about this stuff. And I just wanted to bring attention to Anna Larson, who was a, a graduate student at the University of Victoria at the time. And uh, she was using our equipment both here and on Mauna Kea. And in her study of uh, solar type stars, she detected uh, the signature of an attendant planet. I didn't know about this. I actually attended her uh, graduate uh, exam, and that's the first I heard about it. But the whole thing seemed to get downplayed. Uh, Jeff Marcy was one of her, her examiners, and her her uh, supervisor had the this dog whistle statement that well he wasn't so much interested in planets but as in, interested in the stars themselves. So I think, uh, unfortunately, she got passed over, and uh, uh, because again, uh, the people uh, Hatsis and uh, and uh, Cochrane followed up on this one, and indeed it turned out to be a true planet. Again, in this case, somewhat extra massive, about two times the, uh, the mass of Jupiter, and in a. Uh, a uh, a nearly two-year orbit. So it was in uh, somewhat later that uh, Maya and Quillets uh, were able to detected um, very short period planet, just four days, in an orbit which was half the uh, radius of the Earth's orbit and half a Jupiter mass around the star F, F 52 uh, peg. And uh, while this curve doesn't, it looks very convincing. In fact, it required a lot of adjustment because these were uh, 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 observations assembled over several years and they had to be sort of kludged. And some of us, including me, were rather skeptical that that's what they got. But uh, Marcy and Butler, who were another group, went out and observed it and over a few nights, and they got a perfect curve. So indeed, there were, uh, they were hot Jupiters. I don't still want to spend very much time on this. Uh, we flagged the possible companions to Epsilon Eri, Gamma Cephei, and uh, unfortunately, Bruce Campbell, who was working with me, I uh, was forced to leave uh, astronomy and the project because uh, he couldn't get a, a permanent position. Uh, and that was in 1990. That was before suddenly uh, extrasolar planet, extrasolar astronomy, or I should say, extra planetary, <laughs> extrasolar planets became a, a big thing. We announced. Uh, we wrote a separate paper in uh, 1992, but uh, we questioned, we, we put a question mark to it. There might have been some other interpretation, such as rotation for what we found. Anyway, it all ran through and very much later in 2019, as you know, uh, Mayana Krolos got the uh, Nobel Prize. Anyway, that's all of that stuff. But we, th these weren't the only efforts going, going ahead. There was the possibility of detecting planets by transit. Here is a transit of Venus across the sun. And the idea was to look at a very large field of stars, which was, uh, had a lot of stars in it. And that was the Kepler Space uh, uh, Telescope, uh, which looked at uh, a large area of the sky using a whole raft of uh, detectors. And they looked for and detected uh, uh, very many uh, eclipses uh, as, or transits, I should say, of uh, planets across the disks of their uh, parent star. 
And here are a few examples. Of course, they were tending to pick up the very uh, short period systems. You see the periods here are all uh, three or four days. But that has been by far the most productive and has produced thousands of candidates. Also a more esoteric system was one in which uh, a star with a planet could act as a lens, a gravitational lens for a star, some star in its background. And by so doing, it would reveal the presence of a planet if such a thing was there. And uh, I have to show you this one because I found it. Here is the, uh, here is the concept. There is the star in the background. And here comes the star with a planet. That's the little green thing. And as it goes across, it distorts and magnifies the image behind. And as you see the light curve it, down here in the corner, it's got a little pip on it. Uh, and that little pip corresponds to the presence of a planet. Unfortunately, and several planets have been discovered this way, but unfortunately that only happens once, it doesn't repeat. And so you don't get very much more information. On the other hand, uh, planets have now been directly detected. This is a, uh, you can see the, the date up in the top left corner here. This is a case where a bright star's image has been blanked out almost completely. And this was work done by a colleague of mine here in Vancouver, Victoria. And what they've they detected over the years is four planets which are glowing. And you can see the, the different motions of these. And this, uh, this was a great uh, triumph for the direct detection technique. The size of the system they detected uh, is shown on the left relative to the size of our system. You can see that the planets are very far out. There are many astronomical units, many light minutes, hours away from the, uh, uh, the uh, parent star. And here again from the uh, the Webb telescope is a very recent image, which they published again using a system where the bright star has been blocked out. They're showing you the image of a, uh, an attendant planet. Not only that, there are certain regions in the sky where we're seeing what appear to be rogue planets. These are planets which are not associated with any star. I won't go into the reasons why we think those are there, but this is a, a whole group of them. There are about 40 or 50 single planets out in space, which have probably been shed by their original planetary systems. But initially, again, the whole uh, pressure was to look for uh, stars in the so-called um, green zone in which there would be liquid water on a sur surface of a solid planet. And so you have this ha habitable zone in which the Earth just resides and the other uh, terrestrial planets sit outside of it. And the push was to find an Earth mass planet in that habitable zone. But uh, this was based on the idea, the simple physics, that the average temperature of the planets as you moved out from the Earth got colder and colder and extremely cold, all the way out to uh, Neptune here at almost absolute zero. But I'd like to, that, that concept is now uh, being revised because the idea that life requires liquid water is, is valid, but it doesn't have to be on the surface. If you look out in space towards the, uh, our galaxy, you see large obscuring clouds 
of basically like industrial smog, which redden the stars right behind it or block the light out altogether. And radio astronomers and optical astronomers have discovered huge numbers of complex molecules in those clouds. You don't have to recognize anything there just to realize there's a, a huge number of them. And there's some very complex ones. Uh, this, this one here, which is a so-called fullerene, has got 60 carbon atoms in it. And I was uh, associated with the discovery of that uh, a, a decade ago. In fact, the, uh, the, uh, there's these clouds in space are not too different from the effluent from uh, the average uh, gas-fired vehicle, which you were referring to earlier. And there's several thousand uh, tons of uh, micrometeorites, which are, have got that composition, fall on the Earth each year. So the complex molecules necessary for life are out there in space and falling on the earth all the time and always have done. Uh, this again, trying to st stay uh, up with the news. This is just uh, two days ago. The Japanese have returned a, a sample from an asteroid uh, and they find uh, a, a drop of water in it, which uh, may not sound like much to you, but this uh, very much bolsters the idea that uh, life may have been seeded from outer space. So life, I'm not a biologist, so it, it, I, all I want to show here is the fact that uh, single cell organisms uh, have a, a membrane uh, which uh, <clears throat> is semi-permeable and allows the pH on the interior to be rather different than that on the outside, it allows chemistry to go on. And uh, the, um, the DNA provides the coding, if you like, for reproduction and the activity. And the whole system avoids uh, disintegrating according to the second law of thermodynamics by using energy from outside, whether it's solar energy, chemical energy, or whatever. And uh, as far as we know, life of that sort has been around on Earth for more than 3 billion years. And stromatolites are still with us, and they have, uh, <clears throat> they're still around. They, they still survive in environments which are not uh, conducive to uh, multicellular, life on earth this is a very a very saline area of australia and uh we also have uh non-oxygen uh, uh, mats of uh bacteria or microbes it's still in existence in certain areas we know that uh life exists in uh extremely hot environments super super hot and super cold, at least uh, under the, the uh, lakes under Antarctica. It's only about oh, uh, half a billion years ago or 600 billion years ago that life began to organize into multicellular systems and where individual cells uh, had different uh jobs to do such as we are that is they together they were considerably more uh well preserved than as they were as single uh cell organisms and so uh we can look on earth for instance where life might have begun uh there the hydrothermal vents which uh, we've, have been found all along the uh, edges of tectonic plates, which are floating on the uh, interior of the earth. And uh, these vents, which are got super uh, heated um, or 
superheated fluid, which is uh, full of what we would consider a very toxic material venting into the surrounding ocean. And they're surrounded by uh, life. Uh, this is the red of um, hemoglobin or in the uh, associated uh, tubular uh, life forms at one of these vents. And the, de the deposited remains of all of these billions of years of uh, organisms such as the stromatolites, we of course can see in cliffs like these uh, white cliffs of Dover. And what has been cycling on earth is the fact that we have volcanoes and lava flows, which recycle this uh, carbonaceous material to the surface and prevent the carbon dioxide. I know we make a big, uh, we're upset about how much we're venting at the moment, but under normal circumstances, it was all part of the cycle of life. If we look at the planets that we know, and this is where we really have to start uh, looking to see whether life exists uh, outside of the earth, Venus has a, a, a colossally thick uh, carbon dioxide atmosphere. It has a runaway greenhouse effect. But the surface, again, has, uh, shows evidence of uh, volcanoes and lava flows. And uh, it's, uh, while it's, it's hot enough to melt lead on the surface, it, at one time, it probably enjoyed a very similar climate to Earth. Whether there was life at that time, we don't know. There are suggestions of phosine in the atmosphere at the moment, which some people interpret as having been produced by uh, some sort of life form. I can't go into that because it's very preliminary and uh, we have to wait for more results. Naturally, the the most obvious candidate was Mars. Mars being smaller than Earth, did not retain its atmosphere well, and particularly didn't have a gravitation, excuse me, a magnetic field, which allowed the uh, solar wind to blast off uh, probably most of the remaining atmosphere. So its atmospheric pressure is just less than 1% of that on Earth, and its surface temperature is very low. But you can see over here giant volcanoes. There's no question that there was heavy volcanic activity at one time. We have uh, uh, what are obviously dry riverbeds, and we have a, a rift valley, which is much larger than the, any rift valley on Earth. And these all indicate that at one time, the surface of Mars must have had liquid water and there would have been a, a reasonable atmosphere. And that, of course, was the push, was to look for any surface life, and, but that's not been found. However, as soon as one scrapes the surface, you get down to permafrost and the presence of, of uh, water, frozen water in this case. But if you look at the ice cap, which is uh, both water and frozen CO2, carbon dioxide, penetrating radar has shown that there is, there are lakes below the surface. And in July of 2016, uh, a body of water about a meter and a kilometer and a half down or a mile down uh, was roughly the, the size of Lake Superior was down there. So the question arises, is, is there still life in, 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 in such an environment? And again, catching up with the news, I think this came in three days ago, there, the idea that there may be many uh, lakes, uh, Martian lakes uh, underground has now been uh, pushed hard that in fact, there may be a considerable amount of underground lakes, and that's an obvious place to look in future. 
Now, if you look up at the night sky, particularly around midnight tonight, you'll see Jupiter. It's at its closest to us. It has been for years. It's only about four uh, astronomical units away. And with a pair of binoculars or whatever, you'll see the so-called Galilean satellites, which got him in so much, so much trouble because said, oh, they're going around Jupiter just like the planets go around the sun. But when, when space probes have uh, gone to uh, Jupiter, they found that these, uh, these satellites, these moons of Jupiter, are quite remarkable. First of all, Io is this pizza-like uh, image, and it's covered with yellow sulfur and allotropes of sulfur, the red allotrope and the black allotrope. And uh, when Voyager 1 got there in 79, uh, uh, it actually saw a volcano going off, sh pushing uh, material very high. There's no atmosphere, but this is related to outflows of uh, uh, sulfurous material over the surface. And there are at least 150 active volcanoes have been detected since then. And why Io, which is just the same size as the Earth's moon, should show all of this is largely due to the, the uh, heavy, heavily, heavy tidal effect introduced by the other satellites and Jupiter itself, which squeeze and stretch and squeeze and stretch and produce a lot of heating in the interior, which is causing the sulfur to boil out of it. When we go to, to Saturn, we find Titan, which that looks like a fuzzy image, but in fact, Titan has an atmosphere and has an atmosphere like Earth's, which is an atmosphere largely of nitrogen. And it has a very, uh, it has a frozen surface, but no obvious signs of uh, uh, water or activity. It's probably not a very good candidate for any uh, living form at the moment. But what you see down in the corner there, that much smaller moon, which is Enceladus, that presents a snowball. And that snowball is very smooth on one part. It has a few craters on another, which suggests that's much older. But this surface here is basically icy and doesn't look very different from that on Iceland. And uh, when Enceladus is backlit by the sun, it was possible to see that there were actually jets or geysers erupting from the surface of Enceladus. Not un unfamiliar, not unsimilar to the uh, geysers uh, erupting from the surface of uh, the Earth in places like Yosemite, where because in, in the especially cold conditions, it turns immediately to ice crystals. But the uh, the Enceladus ones indicate, and, the, and the, the dynamics indicate that there's a very deep ocean of water and that there must be some source of heating which is causing these uh, jets. And the material in these uh, jets indicates it's not pure water, it's a sort of a briny water, all of which indicates conditions entirely feasible for life to exist. So whether it be in your lifetime, it certainly won't be in mine, we can expect a probe to dig down and check for actual life forms. Europa, which is another of the uh, satellites of uh, Jupiter, shows exactly the same phenomenon. And although we see fewer jets, we don't see jets from it, but you can see this, uh, it's, the surface is smooth, it has been un affected by meteoritic impact, so it must be being renewed all the time. And again, th these, this discoloration and discontinuities indicate 
And we know that it has a very large ocean underneath, that, that there's a comparison for you. There's a comparison the size between Europa and the Earth. That's roughly the amount of water that's uh, free water on the surface of the Earth compared with a very similar quantity to this much smaller uh, satellite of Jupiter. And again, uh, we're dealing with a system which must have an extremely deep ocean. Again, staying up to date, this is from uh, the Webb Telescope. They published this again just a week or so ago. They've detected carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of a transiting planet, <clears throat> an extrasolar planet. Uh, and this indicates that carbon dioxide is an important component uh, in the atmosphere of that star, excuse me, of that planet. Uh, so this seems to be a ubiquitous situation. So, but what about us? What about uh, multi-celled organisms like ourselves? What are the chances of finding those? This is a list of the some 20 odd planets that are in so-called habitable zones that have been detected so far. Uh, largely by transit. You see on the right comparison with the sizes of the Earth and Mars. And these all fall into this super Earth category. They're arranged in distance from the sun in light years. And this is the one Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star to the sun. It has it, the closest star is Proxima Centauri, which is a, a, a very dim object, it's very faint very cool, only about 3000 degrees, that's the star. And so the habitable zone is very close to it. And the planet has a period of about uh, four days. And that means that it's, it, it's sorry, 11 days, excuse me. So that means that it's, uh, each year would last about 11 days, but we don't know much more about the the planet than that, whether it has, uh, what sort of surface it has or anything of that sort. But all of these are of interest to the uh, SETI Institute Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And they've been operating for many years. They have a, uh, a, a set of telescopes set up at the Hat Creek Observatory, which has been around a long time. And they're looking for unnatural signals, that is generated signals, the sort of thing that is carrying my voice uh, at the moment, if it's on radio. Uh, they're looking for anything which indicates a, an artificially generated signal. And of course, that's what the pulsars appear, appeared to be when they were initially discovered. We're still hoping, they're still hoping for a contact. I don't mean, I'm not trying to, uh, make light of it, it's still a very worthwhile thing to do, but whether there are organisms with our level of ability to do what I did when my father said in with few grunts what the size of the universe was and what was in it, uh, that we don't know. I'm sure there are certainly going to be uh, multi-celled organisms out there, but the question is, will they reply? <laughs> anyway, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Uh, I really appreciate your, your time in the business to give us some nice historical perspective of the search for exoplanets. Um, and we have some uh, questions both in the Zoom audience and here at Friendly House. So I'll go back to, um, to the first one that came in from Val Humble. Um, and he asks, how do you estimate the mass of extrasolar planets? Do you have to assume a mass for the star? Yes, very good question. And that's quite straightforward. 
except what we don't know in most cases is what the inclination of the orbit is to our line of sight. So uh, if you remember the animation I showed you, the star was moving around a common center of gravity. So that quickly, it's like a Roman balance, that quickly tells you what the relative masses are of the sun and the, and, or the, the planet and the, uh, the star. But what you don't know is whether it's the orbit is inclined in, in the line of sight, unless it also transits the star. Once you know it transits, then you know you're looking in the plane and you're getting the right mass. But uh, as the uh, uh, inclination increases, uh, you, you, you have to increase the, the relative mass in order to get the deflection you see. So there is a, that level of uncertainty. We've got a comment from Kathy Moyd, who says when she worked at Joint Propulsion Laboratory, she worked with the Kepler project before its launch. So she ah. have some more comments coming up. That was yeah. very far-sighted. Uh, uh, Baruki uh, put that proposal forward in the early 90s. Uh, it took him some time to get it funded and so on. And uh, uh, but once up, it produced uh, so many results. And it's still, the, uh, well, it's been followed on by the so-called TESS uh, satellite, which is, does the same thing, but uh, over a much larger area and for many more stars. Yeah, I mean, definitely there was a, you know, it was it was a big technology effort. In fact, it, it got delayed because they hadn't really figured out whether they could actually do it. But um, yeah. I also, while, while, I, while I'm here, I also uh, was the person who integrated the first set of commands for Galileo when it flew by Europa the first time. Wonderful. Well, you should have given this lecture, not me. No, I I learned a lot. I really appreciate it when when you're working in the people putting the spacecraft together and operating them. You don't always learn all the science that's involved in what you're doing. You know, I I almost flashed up the thing I usually flash up for students is that information is conveyed by the unexpected, and science is about doubt. And I, I think a lot it, people are beginning to recognize that that. As soon as these space probes and other things went up, they were, they were looking for one thing, but they found another because it's only once you've got these tools that you begin to, uh, it, nature is much more interesting than we, than we can imagine. Yeah, I, very, I good to meet, very good to encounter you. I, 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 yeah, I also worked with the Voyager project uh, during the Jupiter and Saturn flybys and so saw Lindemore Beatles picture of the uh, yeah. volcano and the discovery of the rings and uh, you know I mean it's a really exciting time to be involved. Oh it's extraordinary uh, yeah but going back over my <laughs> career I mean I think what, what things were at the beginning of it and the I, I mean I don't know what in your case it's probably quite different but in my case it, it, somebody would ask you so what do you do Oh, I'm an astronomer. What? <laughs> That's if I taken holy orders or something. And but but there's no money in that, is there? Or <laughs> but now I think because of these space probes and the sort of things people like you did, uh, there's a huge interest. Uh, yes. Okay, we have a um, question from Kathy. Do we keep discovering extrasolar planets at a steady rate, or does the rate keep increasing over time? Well, I'm, I'm not uh, fully in, involved in it anymore, but what is happening, of course, is that the longer you observe, the more candidates come up. And in order to avoid embarrassment, you have to make sure of these candidates. Some are, Quite a few candidates have had to be rejected, for instance, because they turn out to be 
due to spots on the star and not actual transit. I mean, uh, there's a whole range of things which I didn't get into. So the answer is there are just going to be more and more. Uh, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to know how to to uh, handle this because what are, what are the ones that are going to be the most interesting? I suspect it'll still be solar systems like our own and what are the possibilities of finding a, a blue marble and so forth. But um, the other activity which has, I, I didn't get into, I had a slide for it, but I took it out is the fact that we can see a lot of uh, planetary systems in formation. They are being picked up by uh, these large arrays of telescopes, such as the ALMA array in the Altacama, Altiplano. And we're seeing uh, a lot of planetary formations going on, actual uh, planetoids and so forth, but also the dust rings and rings associated with the uh, initial nebula, which forms in around the sun or the star. Thank you. We have a question here at Friendly House from Dave Gray. Dave, would you step to whichever mic you prefer? You said in the beginning of your talk that maybe there's another guy out there and millions of light years away who's giving a talk like yours and I, well, that's kind of amusing, but that actually got me to thinking about this question, which you sort of answered at the end. And that is, that seems to be an assumption that the chemical elements that make up life here are out there uh, throughout the whole universe. Therefore, that the particular combination of certain chemical elements that form what we call life may, may have happened out there in every, uh, in every planet. Um, or or is, that just, is that just an assumption? Or is it actually known that those elements are out there in all those other places? That's an excellent idea, a question. You may or may not be aware of the Miller-Urey experiment, which took place back in the 50s. That is where they just took uh, a flask, put in it all these basic elements that would have been around at the, uh, in the early Earth, put them in a flask and uh, with some water and uh, discharged some sparks through it to mimic lightning and left the thing running for, I don't know, a couple of months. And when they went back, there were some of the basic building blocks that are necessary for life. We certainly know we have lightning on Earth. And there's no question about the existence of these, uh, all of these basic uh, molecules in space. It's just unbelievable what we've been being able to pick up. And the thing is, it, how transitory is life? Uh, it's very likely that Venus, when the sun was cooler, it was about 20% cooler early on, uh, would have been a perfect place for life to develop. But as you can see, it's, uh, it's, it's hell right now. It's, uh, you can melt lead on its surface. Almost certainly that may have happened on Mars. Maybe we are a bit lucky, but uh, also multi-celled organisms uh, are much more fragile. My understanding is that the human race dropped to less than a thousand individuals uh, about 90,000 years ago. You know, the, but the, the persistence of uh, single cell, I think is, I don't know. I, it, it seems to me it's inevitable. Sorry, that's a long, long answer to your short question. We have a question from Renga. Renga, would you come on and ask your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Walker, 
thank you very much for a lively bird's eye bird's eye view but sharp view presentation of this uh, complex field and uh, as an astronomer actually i really appreciate your uh, uh, presentation but i want to ask you one thing uh, uh, comment you briefly referred to the possibility of uh, complex molecules or even bacteria coming to the earth from outside you may remember that it was fred hoyl and vikram singhe who had suggested it uh, many years ago but at that time they were sort of poo poo and people thought they were uh, people were even they called crazy people etc of course fred hoyl has always been known for his uh, bold ideas which many of them were turned out to be true so therefore one has to keep in mind that what is something crazy at one time maybe 20 years 30 years later there may be much more validity on that yeah well i i certainly knew fred hoyl uh, when i was a student yeah. and i also wrote a paper with wickram and singh and okay. uh, i i think the word you used just now is bacterium I, I only indicated that we have the complex molecules out in space, that, which could mm -hmm. come down. Uh, Hoyle and Wickram and Singh came out with the idea that uh, th there were pandemics on Earth which were being seeded from space. And uh, I, I think that was a little bold uh, because they used what I think was rather faulty statistics to, su to suggest that they were uh, breaking out simultaneously in remote parts of the, the world and that they could only be explained that way. But yes, I, uh, uh, Fred Hoyle was a great, truly a great inspiration for me to get into astronomy. He had a, uh, also you probably aware that he wrote that book, wrote his book, yeah. uh, what was it, The Dark yes. Cloud? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, another, uh, another interesting thing is that uh, 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 we know that people have been talking about, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I think I lost my thread. <laughs> Something I wanted to tell, but I, I, I just lost. Maybe I, I'll uh, come up later. Okay. But about this civilization, this thing, there is another. Uh, okay. Yeah. The, the point is that the life, how it develops in other places. You see, there's a complex system because in the earth itself, did not have oxygen in the early days. So it came much later and then maybe led to a uh, very different type of organism. So maybe similar type of chemistries may be happening in different ways and in different planets. And therefore it's a complex field. So we can't just uh, assume that things will happen only the way which happens in the earth. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I mean, it's my understanding that chlorophyll was a one shot. It's not like eyesight and so forth, which developed several times, but chlorophyll only happened just once and maybe it was uh, very unexpected. So photosynthesis uh, could well be an aberration and that, uh, the, the need or the, the development of oxygen uh, is, is not something which will have happened everywhere. I don't know, but uh, I think it's all part of the issue that we're, quote, looking for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Renga. I think we only have time for one more question. Joyce, could you come up to the microphone and ask your question? Um, it may be a bit of a pedestrian question, but what kinds of equipment do we still need before we can actually discern what's out there? and? What kind of signs would tell us that we were looking at life extraterrestrially? I think, uh, let me take the first one, uh, the last one first. Uh, I think that's going to be very controversial. Uh, I, I think the, the so-called signal will have to, would be interpreted in terms of ourselves for a start. We don't know what the cadence would be of other life, I mean, we have a pulse that goes once every second, but it could be uh, blue whales or something that go every minute. Uh, and I, I don't know, to be quite honest. Uh, I think, as I tried to present here, I think the, uh, the future is to, to look carefully at places like Enceladus or 
But anyway, to look carefully there for any subsurface life forms, because I think if you find that, after all, the Earth was a snowball, just like Enceladus uh, at one time, and the stromatolites and all these things survived all through that. Uh, the, the Earth has gone through really uh, large changes of climate, you know, it was uh, tropical at the poles or it's been all uh, glaciated over, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, exactly what leads us to communicate and send out signals, I don't know. And how we interpret that, I think is, uh, that, that, that would remain, if we like the, the, the so-called first extrasolar planets, there's a lot of debate about whether that's what they were. But thank you for the question. Thank you again, Dr. Walker, for your very interesting presentation.